Today we have Lawrence Jordan and Richard Sanchez, co-founders of Master the Workflow, on to talk about their courses on how to become an assistant editor in the film and TV industry. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, so I wanted to just say I've heard a lot about your courses and how invaluable they are to demystifying the assistant editor duties and workflow of post-production. Um, how did you two come together to form Master the Workflow? And what made you want to become teachers of the trade? You want me to take that, Richard? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you start? Because I remember it, uh, I remember it uh, very vividly. Uh, Richard and I had been working together. Uh, I think it was our second picture. No, it was our third picture together. You know, we were in the midst of it. We were sort of like just in the trenches and he was working his butt off. And uh, I walked into his room and I had a little downtime. I was waiting for some dailies or something. And, uh, you know, I just saw this uh, this system he had going. And I had been a, a, an assistant editor in film for uh, many years, about, you know, about uh, five seven years. And uh, I always kept a, uh, a paper code book and, you know, we used to track the film, you know, physically. I saw what Richard had set up. Being an editor, you don't really, you know, you kind of lose track of what the assistants, you know, are doing over, over time. You know, I started thinking about it and Richard started showing me his code book, which is a FileMaker Pro based uh, set of databases. Like I say, I started thinking about it and I thought, and also Richard had started to have people come in to quote unquote shadow him, you know, and I asked him what that was about. And it was just, you know, people who wanted to learn the process, you know, and Richard was kind enough to let, let them kind of hang out over his shoulder. And so, uh, you know, it just got me thinking that the process had changed so much from when I was an assistant and there were really no resources available to learn the cutting room workflow other than being in the cutting room. So it was kind of like a catch-22. You know, how do you get into the cutting room if you don't know the workflow? And, you know, how do you learn the workflow if you don't know, can't get into a cutting room? You know, I just pitched the idea to Rich and uh, we, we tossed it around for a while. And uh, Master of the Workflow was born, feature film assistant editor immersion. Yeah, you know, and it's funny too because the the shadowing process too, which is a, a pretty traditional way of you know folks learning the craft, is also a process that is it, it can be a little flawed in itself too because the problem that in, invariably happens is, uh, you know, if someone would reach out and say, hey, can I sit with you for one day? You know, I'd be like, yeah, of course, you know. And if we're in dailies and they go, well, I want to learn turnovers, and it's like we're not going to be touching turnovers for months, so uh, <laughs> there's really nothing I can show you. Or like, hey, I want to learn how to do visual effects. We are a long way from that, you know, but I can show you dailies and or, you know, if someone comes in and I'm doing turnovers, oh, I want to see how you organize dailies. Oh, I'm, I, I finished those months ago. We're we're just not there. And so you're sort of at the mercy of where you are in the process. And it's 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 still a great way to learn. But there are inherent problems. And so an, uh, a, one of the things we were trying to tackle with this class was I, I would love to I'd love to show someone how to do the process soup to nuts. You know, like I want to show you everything about that and you know un unless someone is dropping me a line you know every three months and that's that can also become a lot to ask too because you know with turnovers you're always under the gun with turnovers it's you got to be fast and so, so that's also one of those times where you know if someone were to stop me down to ask me a bunch of questions mid turnover it would be more of a situation of I, I can't stop right now. I got to jam on this. I can talk about it later, you know? And so this presented an opportunity for us to go, let's take this slow. Let me show you what this is. Let me show you everything at the whole process, you know? And so that was a real big, uh, a real big challenge we wanted to tackle with Master the Workflow. Uh, how long ago did you create it? Back in that, 2017. Gosh, yeah. That was, yeah, we were just finishing Naked for for netflix and that was when we initially recorded it in fact it's really funny because i mean it becomes a, a bit of a time capsule in and of itself um 
looking at the version of the code book that that we were working with then and i, I kind of look at it now and go oof you know <laughs> compared to the the newer versions because you know the the as the workflow evolves so does you know the database and we've we've up, updated that at i think two or three times at this point you know just to go hey here are different ways of tackling these problems and here's how we handle it nowadays you know yeah, it's really become streamlined. Uh, Richard Richard most recently did a uh, a major overhaul, uh, which is our our you know current product 4.0, and um, it, it like like Rich says, it's it's worlds apart. It's just it's it's really slick. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. So you you have several different courses. So you have the flagship course, which is your feature film assistant editor immersion 1.0 course. And then you also have like different uh, different courses, like the twelve part intro course, become a professional assistant film and television editor. Did you do that after, or how did that work? Why, why did you decide to make the intro course? Well, you know, because a lot of people come to uh, Master of the Workflow and they don't have any idea of what um, the process of the uh, cutting room is, and. Um, the course itself, uh, you know, we tell people that you really need to have sort of like a fundamental working knowledge of the AVID, you know, ha have at least taken like an AVID 101 course or have familiarity with another nonlinear editing system like Premiere or Resolve or even Final Cut. Just, you know, so you have some sort of, you know, grounding in what we teach because, you know, we really get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, every step of the way, every step of the process from, you know, pre-production, you know, where you're meeting with your editor and, you know, what to say in the interview all the way through final delivery. You know, it's a very specific set of tasks and they're quite detailed. I mean, you know, you'll get a, uh, a PDF of deliverables on, on a show from one studio and there'll be a, a, you know, a totally different set of deliverables from another studio. So, you know, same thing with turnovers for sound or DI. So, you know, it's really learning the, uh, you know, the, the subtleties of, of the job um, that, we, that we really cover in the immersion course. And, you know, the intro course is just that. It's, it's sort of like a broad stroke overview of each step of the process that we teach in the immersion course. It's, you know, just to give people an idea of whether, you know, this is, this is for them or not. Yeah, I, I took your course, the 12 part intro course. And, um, it really does give you just like, like you said, the broad strokes that really you're going to go into more detail in the immersion course. So, and, and also the lingo. I mean, if you are starting out as an editor or wanting to get into assistant editing, especially with studio work, scripted work, it's very different terminology that you need to learn. So, um, sure. you, you know, and with the intro course, it really did go over all uh, or some of the um, stuff, you know, the way that you say things. And, and then really to go into the immersion course is really going to take you into a deep dive. Do you want to talk a little bit about the immersion course, like how you broke it up, how you guys work together to create it? Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. yeah. Take out. Yeah. Much. You know. Uh, you know, the immersion, co the, the immersion course was kind of one of those things too. you know, as we were coming to the end of Naked, I believe you were going on to another project and I was committed to another project. And so I was also trying to get, you know, get Larry, somebody who he knew he could trust. And that kind of was sort of the birth of it is like, we need to, let's set up a, a process to really train people. Cause you know, and, and so it, and it really did come down, you know, uh, taking past experiences of myself and, you know, you mentioned the terminology and that's a really good point. Cause sometimes I feel like people just rattle off terms real quick to see how you're going to react you know, and I always feel like it fills it fills the um, the subject with uh, this sense of should I say yes even though I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right. or should I uh, should I stop to ask? And I find the latter is always the scarier thing to do. Uh, but you know, the 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 one thing I've finally come to to peace with is you know like stopping them down and and uh you know my my uh my go-to phrase i always like to say is 
I think I know what you're talking about, but I might know it by a different phrase. Can you can you say what you mean when you mean that? And and I think the reason why that's important is nine times out of ten, when they tell me what they mean, I absolutely do know what they mean, and I still to this day will never forget an interview that I had for a show. And it was going to be a, a big show relative to anything I'd ever worked on at the time. And they asked me if I knew what scripter was. And I didn't know what scripter was. And I should have said that because I choked and they knew it. And in that, like, there was a split second moment when my life slowed down. And I was like, <laughs> you did not get this job. And I didn't, and I made a phone call to a friend, and I said, do you know what Scripter is? And they said, oh, that's Script Sync. And I was like, I know what I know what Script Sync is. Right. And so it's, you know, all that to say, you know, to, to anyone else who's, if you're ever in the situation, just go, I think I know what you're talking about, but can you, can you tell me that again? You know, because that is, you know, very much a thing we wanted to demystify. And, you know, and, and it really does start from the beginning because, you know, the, the relationship with your editor. You know, I used to have a world of anxiety just meeting with, with my editors, you know, and what do you say? And, you know, what can I say to impress this person? Which, you know, once you go down that rabbit hole, you're kind of already going down a bad path because ultimately it, it, it it's about working with, you know, your partner in this process and making sure you, your your personalities gel and you want your personality to be on display because that is who you're going to be spending 14 hours a day with for the next six to eight months, you know, and so I, I think there's, you know, like just... How do we add, like? How do we figure out what we like and what we bond over? And that's the beginning of your relationship. And then once you're there, let's talk about how we're gonna work together. And you know, I mean, there's so much more than just knowing the avid and knowing how to deliver this stuff. There's you know, there's relationships. And quite honestly, uh, you know, um, there is in the cutting room. There's a lot of ego management. You know, the editor has to do that with the people they work with and the studio and the assistant editor by proxy of that has to work with the same people i mean it's it's you know like they say you are the um you're the psychologist you are the psychiatrist and the uh you know but that is the relationship with everyone and that's where it all begins and you know moving on from there then we can move to dailies and you know one thing i always try to stress in the class is um this is not the right way to do it. This is the way I do it. And I, I tried to be really deliberate about that because I will admit it drives me crazy when people in the field like to stress, this is the right way to do it. You're doing it the wrong way. And it's just like everyone does everything a different way and their way is always the right way. So I, you know, just, just like there's, there's a million different ways to do what we do. And most of those uh, most of those methods have pros and cons, and I think the real value is knowing different methods so that when you're in the situation, you can go, well, here's why I would do this on that film, but I don't think I'd do it on this film. I'm going to do it this way, and, you know, um, you know, we try to tackle it from that angle, you know, and from dailies to just general cutting room etiquette, you know, how do we deal with, you know, uh, you know, when when we have scenes to cut and how we deliver those back. And, uh, you know, there's also learn, learning the dynamics of the cutting room. For example, uh, you know, some, some folks are really candid and want candor in the cutting room, and some people don't. And it simply is what it is. And what gets even trickier is some people say they want candor, <laughs> but when you offer it, it is not welcome. And so I think those are those are insights that, you know, we also try to offer, you know, like trying to get to what is being asked and how you can manage that. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it is just one of many situations you're going to encounter sooner or later. And so as long as you are, you know, as long as you're aware of that as a possibility, you can get into the headspace of, oh, well, maybe I need to change my tactics, you know. 
and you know yeah from from dailies to cutting room etiquette to again to visual effects tracking that's where the code book comes in you know the code book as a concept is uh in some people's minds a very old school concept uh some people don't even keep code books nowadays i do largely out of habit but also uh, like going back to terminology the code book is kind of in in the most uh, specific terms, the code book is a small part of the database. You know, going back, like Larry was talking about tracking film, the code book in the most uh, traditional sense was a document that you use to keep track of what elements are on what piece of film so you can track it all back to negative. You know, so this scene, this take is on this camera roll. That camera roll, here's the camera negative. We can all go back. But in a modern context, it really is effectively just a database of every clip you've shot. And in some ways, you could say, well, we don't really need the codebook anymore because the Avid is the database or Premiere is the database. But, you know, there's still a lot of good reasons to keep a traditional database. And a large reason for that is your Avid gets bogged down. It's keeping track of a lot of things. And sometimes it's nice to have this external database that you could at any point go, I need to search through however many clips. And I mean, there can be thousands of clips across hundreds of hours shot in the film and you know to someone who doesn't have an avid you know hey richard can you send me like a thumbnail image of every scene from every shot from scene six and sometimes it can be really valuable to like to whether it is you know your director who's looking for one take and you send them a thumbnail image of you know this one scene and sometimes it also helps um demystify why some scenes are challenging you go why is scene six so hard to get through you go well scene six had eight hours worth of footage shot it had 200 takes you know and scene five didn't it was a short scene and so like like the communication that that opens up and and allows you know the more information you have at your fingertips the better your process is going to work but that also the code book you know the digital code book which again is really a database also we use that for tracking visual effects so when we pull our plates everything is there as the cut changes we update those uh, we keep a one-line continuity in there, which uh, is, you know, a, a pretty a pretty standard practice in feature and television. It, just a paper document with a quick description of every scene so that as you're going, when you deliver a cut, you hand them over a continuity so they can just go, oh, so character drives a car, character goes to the store. Well, what if we switch those orders around, you know? And uh, it, it, it becomes this template that you're just kind of ready to go from the beginning so you're not rebuilding the structure every time. You know, I found before I built that, I was rebuilding this from scratch every time and the idea of, I can just have this prepared and ready to go. Of course, you're probably going to modify it because every show's needs are a little different, but you have this ready to go. It's your backbone, and let's do this, you know? So how do you, on on that, uh, the digital code book, so it's a database, so it's a program that you're giving somebody, and so when they start their project, then they're taking probably a good day or two probably to go through everything and log everything. Is that how you would use it, you're logging everything in there. Well, for example, the code book is one of those things you will be imp importing that data each day of principal photography. So, and you know, with each day of additional photography, that's usually tends to be the last step I do when dailies are coming in. Okay. So, I prepare those dailies, get them out to my editor, make sure everything we were supposed to receive was received, the editor's off working, and then I will bring the data into my code book. So that's kind of a daily task because you're going to have, as each day footage comes in, more data to feed it. So that is a day-by-day -day thing. But then you have things like building out the continuity. That's usually something I do in the first day. And building out a continuity is no small task. It takes... It takes a good amount of time. So, yeah, that is something you're going to build. And you might find very quickly that you go, oh, well, this basic structure is not totally going to work for what we need. So we need to modify it to our needs, you know, and it's the time to do that, you know. And you might also find that it worked for your needs for most of the project. And then two months into it, you need to modify it. And so really what it is, it's a database built in FileMaker Pro. And so, which is a very popular program for uh, for visual effects and 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 for uh, for 
continuities, you know, for editorial paperwork, you know. Uh, I recognize not everyone likes it. I do. And so that's just what I use. But it also comes back to, you know, I do find it's very popular in visual effects. And, and, and it's an important point that I also try to state is that, you know, um, you certainly don't have to use what everyone is using, but industry trends do matter. And so it is one of those things where if you get too far down the rabbit hole doing your own thing on a program that not everyone uses, and then you come into a show where they say, well, we're using this. Well, I don't want to. Well, we're using this because everybody is on the same, you know, when it's, when you're talking about a department of potentially hundreds of people, you're using that. And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, cause like for just using visual effects as an example, you know, the major, the three major uh, tools that I've seen to track visual effects is uh, if you can get away with it, uh, usually on smaller shows with lower visual effects needs, you can use Google Docs, nothing wrong with it. Uh, even though I have seen some very uh, advanced uh, tracking systems on Google Docs, and then what tends to be very popular is FileMaker. FileMaker is great because you can host it on the server, you can host it on the cloud, you can just have a local database. So it's very scale scalable from a small team to a large team. And then you have this other product by Autodesk called Shot uh, Shot Gun Shot. Not it used to be called Shotgun. Uh, what is it called now? Uh, Autodesk Shot Grid, and that's a product people love. That one because you don't have to know FileMaker. Because in in all fairness, FileMaker is not the most intuitive program to learn. So for someone who says I really don't want to learn how to build something in FileMaker, because that is that is the thing with FileMaker is it can be as simple or complex as you build it, but it is by itself nothing it is a platform to build something and so the onus then becomes on you to build that whereas with shotgrid uh, they have this predefined structure that a lot of people in the field know and they have a development team that you can then say well i need this and then they can build out a solution for you and that that can be great if you don't you know if you don't want to invest the time or don't have the time to invest you know learning a product, i.e. FileMaker, you know, but it also does come with the the downside of when you're explaining your needs to an engineer, if they don't understand your needs, that can sometimes be a frustrating experience where you're like, I need this. Like, well, this is close. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't get me what I need, you know. So, you know, the, every there's pros and cons to all of them, you know. Well, that's great that you developed that because it just keeps things very organized and probably searchable. I've worked in FileMaker with other mm -hmm. programs that people have put together. Can you add things to it like that? Maybe I need something else that's not in there. Can I add it in there or is that easy? Yes. Or I kind of have to know what I'm doing. Well, of course, you do have to know what you're doing in order to add something, but, uh, and because, you know, within FileMaker, the development tools, we have the option to lock users out. So uh, if we wanted to, I could lock it and say, you can't modify anything. You can only take it as is. But that really wasn't the, in my opinion, that wasn't the point of it, you know. And, you know, some people get very, um, some people are, are very protective of their database and, Rightly so, they invested a lot of time building them. Uh, so I certainly don't hold it against anyone who would want to prevent someone from being able to modify it. But my thought has always been, for one, my database is never twice the same database from project to project because either I learn something new or I just come across a new need and so I'm always adding on to it. And so the idea is in providing this codebook to our students, it's like this is just the backbone. This is the structure. But if someone says to you, well, I need you to modify this, you know, I need, I need a new kind of report. Okay, well then build the report. You have the data there. You can build what you need. You can modify any of the layouts. You can build new tables. The sky's the limit. But, you know, uh, and, and and I do I do encourage our students is don't take this and treat it like a finished product because it's not. It is the starting point for what you need. And, you know, the main reason for that is, you know, uh, sometimes folks ask me to build things for their show. And, you know, the problem is, I don't have time. I'm working on my own show. And also, even if I did have time, it doesn't benefit them because then they'll always be dependent on what I can build when I have time. And the real 
value is knowing how to modify this for what you need so that when you come onto a new show, you can say, you know, hey, I need this. Yeah, give me give me an hour. I'll build that out. No problem. You know, because, the, you know, the hope is that someone takes the database, builds something new and, you know, one day I'm working on a show with this person. Hey, I took this and I built that. And I go, that's cool. I didn't even think about that. You know, I think that's really exciting, you know, when like, you know, when, you know, we, we all have great ideas. And sometimes it, it becomes easy to go, I built this thing. It's cool and it does everything. And then just someone just goes, here's this. And you go, I didn't even think about that. That's very cool. Right. You know? It's kind of like editing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're really helping out uh, the world of the assistant editor. Um, you know, the, well, we hope so. Yeah, your course has been highly recommended. I hear about it all the time. You know, so it's really like you said, demystifying the position that sometimes, as we're going into the studio world, can be a little daunting and scary. You Heck know? yeah! So you're really kind of just uh, breaking it down and giving people the tools that when they go into an interview. When when those those terms are thrown around, you'll know exactly what it is. And it is funny that there can be uh, two terms for the same thing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Or more. Or more. Yeah. yeah. Depending es on who you're especially talking. when the yeah, exactly. Especially when they're coming from a producer who doesn't really know the term, <laughs> and and they say the wrong term, and right. you know what it is, but they don't know what it is. But uh, yeah, you know it's. Uh, you know, just to, and just to finish up where we kind of left off in terms yeah. of what immersion covers is, you, you know, we we Richard takes them after visual effects through turnovers, picture, sound, you know, color, uh, visual effects, uh, and then um, you know we go through finishing in the mix, and you know the assistant's responsibilities during that uh, during that period of time. You know, VFX reviews, things like that. You know, and a lot of these things are going on concurrently during the cut, certainly during the director's cut. And then, um, you know, the deliverables, what what the studio is going to want to get. And again, that has gotten more complex as the multitude of formats has continued to evolve and, and proliferate. Uh, and, and, and that's another big uh, sort of help with uh, where the code book really helps out because you know some some studios are actually if i'm not wrong richard they're they're actually requiring people to turn over some sort of code book you know yeah it's funny because for for as often as i've heard folks say i don't keep a code book anymore i can't think of many project many feature projects that i've worked on recently that didn't ultimately ask for a code book. And it's kind of one of those things where if you handle it daily, it's not a ton of work to do as long as you just keep up with it. But if you get to the end of, you know, a 60 to 80 day shoot and invariably, you know, someone says with, you know, a week to go, oh, the studio asked for a code book. Can you get us one? You go 90 days of photography into a code book is going to be a long, monotonous process. Uh, and so it's kind of one of those things where I've always just been like, just spend the 15 to 20 minutes a day doing it. Once you're out of principal photography, it doesn't matter. You have it. And it's so much better to just be able to just go, here it is. Or if no one asks for it, there's still, in my opinion, a ton of uses for it. You know, uh, one of the biggest examples I've found is marketing tends to be a, a challenging process. You know, invariably, uh, it just it always happens where generally they're going to request from editorial that we send them a cut and we'll send them a cut with you know all the information burned in and an EDL so that they can track back. And invariably, somebody just got a cut from somewhere that doesn't have the burns or that doesn't have something and what usually ends up happening is they send a trailer to the assistant editors to overcut and it's a horrifically painful process and what i found sometimes the code the value in the code book is i can go oh you can have a copy of my code book that'll tell you where everything is and i could kind of get those requests kind of off my back because you know obviously Marketing is important. We need people to know about the films we're working on, but those requests have a habit of 
popping up when you're horrifically busy with other things that, you know, the thought of, can you overcut this trailer? is like, yeah, or I can do sound effects that my editor has been asking me for all day. Right. <laughs> you know. No, and I was thinking for the person that's inputting uh, the dailies into uh, the code book, uh, it's probably another a memory thing for them that, um, wait a minute, I remember something. I remember I put that in, you know, so it's kind of really another way of knowing the material. Absolutely. Yes. Especially when you factor in things like, you know, thumbnail images, you know, like, uh, you know, just in case Larry comes to me and says, do you remember a profile shot of this actor? And, you know, there's something to be said about, yeah, I do. Let me let me just check that real quick. You know, it's kind of like it's another thing too, like, you know, script sync. Uh, script sync is one of those things that, you know, it's incredibly useful for the editors and it's incredibly uh tedious for assistant editors but there is also a ton of value in it which is yeah then when your editor asks you hey do you remember did he say this line you're like oh yeah that was an improv line i wrote it down let me you know it's like it is one of the all of that all of that plays into it and you know it's interesting because I know some people, you know, you often hear this, the, the idea you should know the footage front to back and can you recall stuff and I wish I had that kind of memory that can just like pull things up and I know people like this who just like, oh, oh yeah, that's right, that was uh, that was day 20 and it was like, and you're like, how did you remember that? But there is a basic familiarity to at least al allow you the notion of, you know, I remember we shot it on this day and then it's like, oh yeah, that's right, it looked like a mistake but you shot that and you intended that for something, you know, and there's, there is a ton of value of having, you know, whether it's via script sync or bringing it into the code book, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's hiding somewhere in the, the back of your mind, you know, and it, yeah, when you need it, it's, it's a valuable thing to have it there, you know. Yeah. And back to the like immersion course with um, you, when you were going over all the factors that go into post-production, uh, one I think can be a little uh, intimidating is sound design, uh, where that's a part of the assistant editor's role. And so you're demystifying that as well and making it where I think half of it is just you don't know until you know. And uh, probably, you know, when you're watching the course, then it's breaking it down for you to really understand how that really works. And, you know, and part of that, too, is, you know, because it sound design is certainly a um, it's a touchy subject, too, because there was a time going back to, you know, the days of the movie Ola and the Cam where you were limited by how many soundtracks you could do. So the level of complexity of sound that you could do in picture editorial was limited. And so the idea that, you know, you do incidental sound, because of course you needed something to play in the cut, but you were pretty limited in what you could do. And so, you know, the sound editors were, you know, completely different job, different classification, and they would have been brought on earlier to bring that in. And that has certainly changed the dynamics of that job. And so it can be really important to know what is your job? What isn't your job? And likewise, you know, just kind of where, how, how the field has changed in the sense of, you know, because, you know, some people get really adamant. You can only do incidental sound. You can't do, you can't do a full, can't do a full sound mix. And nowadays in both television and film, even for your temp cuts, you they generally kind of expect a nearly arable sound bed, you know? And I mean, the level of these sound mixes are incredible, you know? Temps. The yeah, oh yeah. And they're, 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 I mean, temps, but they are, the, the, the expectation is through the roof. But there are some tasks that I've certainly been asked as an assistant editor that are unreasonable and that I'll push back against now but earlier in my career I didn't because I didn't know any better and those are kind of the important things to know when someone asks you like hey can you give me this you know knowing where the dividing line between you should just give them that and where you should go that's really not my responsibility I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to do my job and I'm happy to make accommodations to make everyone's life easier but then when when people start asking me to do their job, knowing when you should really push back. Because again, it's not a matter of not being a team player. There is a point where you're simply being asked to do 
someone else's job and you have enough things to worry about. And I think that's also one of those things where it comes with experience, but also uh, with with the confidence to push back because it doesn't it doesn't feel good to have to say someone, no, I'm not doing that, you know, uh, but it's it is important because that's how we prevent job erosion. And it's also just making sure like as an assistant editor that I'm able to give my editor the time they need uh, by having my time available to them and not taking time away from my editor because someone's asking me to do something that really shouldn't be my task. Do you have a, an example, one or two examples of what that would what that looks like? Oh, I have a good one. Yeah, please. <laughs> it's a and it's. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day. Apparently, it still is a pretty common thing uh, because I used to get asked this all the time when I worked in unscripted television. Um, in turnovers, what would happen often is uh, so. In it, some shows work differently, but oftentimes, you know, you get the the external sound recorder and you get that sunk to your camera and your editor is going to work with generally, if they can get away with it, they're going to work with the mix track, just the mix track. And the mix track doesn't always sound great, but usually it's good enough to get by. And if you absolutely need to swap it out, maybe you'll swap it out with the boom or the lav every now and then if just, you know, the sound gets missed, you know, but realistically, you know, you might have eight or nine tracks recorded and the editor's only working with one because it keeps their timeline manageable. You don't want this nasty track, you know, where you can't find anything. But what would happen very often to me when I was working in Unscripted is the sound team would say, I need you to go back in there and match back to every track and cut in all nine tracks for every piece of dialogue the editor used. And when I was young and didn't know any better, ah. I'd say, okay. And that would, that would cost me... I mean, half a day, maybe a day. And especially if you have like stacked audio. So you have, you know, like maybe the editor only put two or three tracks. But when you multiply that by nine, now I need 27 tracks. And I'm playing timeline Tetris to kind of make everything fit. And I didn't realize, you know, at the time that it's like, no, there are tools and pro tools and some external tools to handle that. And that is as a picture assistant, that's not your job, and, and you really shouldn't be doing that, you know? So it's one of those things. But, of course, it is important to know what turnovers I need to give the sound department to make sure they have what they need to get that done. So, you know, making sure that I give them a sound EDL that tracks, in, you know, EDLs typically track tape name and time code. But if the sound was recorded separately, I need to make sure that we're tracking the sound roll and the sound time code so that they can pull that. And then there's a program called Titan, which is one of a few products that they use uh, in order to match back to the original uh, sound masters. Because you can send all of your tracks via an AAF from the Avid to Pro Tools. And I was recently talking to a sound uh, editor, and I was saying, I could theoretically just give you an AAF. What's wrong with just me giving you an embedded AAF? What I didn't realize is when it comes into the Avid, sometimes it modifies some of that metadata. And so for the sound editors, they go, I want the original metadata from the original recorder because that's what reports are going to reference. And it's like, oh, okay. So there really is a lot of value in going back to the original sound masters. So again, when I was younger and working in unscripted, I didn't know any better, so I just accepted it and I said, I'll do that. And it would it would cost me a lot of time and and I think assistant editors working in projects where that really should should not be their job need to know like you can push back on that, you know. And and I think there there is an art to pushing back in a way that doesn't become adversarial. Um it can simply be you know, I just, I really don't have time. I'm sorry. This is what I have. I have other things I have to get to. And, you know, no one likes being told no, but there is an art to doing that because you have to protect yourself and your time. And really, because your time is so directly linked to your editor's time, it really is about respecting yourself and your editorial team. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like the difference between the editor and then the assistant editor. And Lawrence, like you as being the editor, um, do you do any sound design or pretty much the assistant is giving you all of this? You might do some tweaks, but really goes to the sound department to do the final. So where do you take over? So much has to do with the, you know, the kind of scope of the project. I mean, if I'm working on a small little in uh, independent 
you know, film with, with only one assistant, um, you know, I can only turn over so much to them. So, you know, I'll take, I'll take it on myself. Uh, you know, and I enjoy cutting sound and, 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 you know, certainly, but what happens, for example, like on the last film I did, there was over 200 hours of dailies. So, you know, what's happened to editors is, is that they're so overwhelmed with footage to go through that usually it's established pretty early on that, um, you know, you'll lay out basically the, the dialogue uh, you know, you might have some ideas and throw, you know, throw some, you know, depending on, you know, whether or not you have sort of like an expansive library or something like that. Uh, you know, you might throw a few effects in and things like that, but usually I'll, I'll just, you know, ask my assistant, can you, you know, certainly throw in some backgrounds and some beds. And then, you know, if there's more specific things, you know, I'll ask for them. But, you know, if we're going to do like a big, uh, you know, chase scene, action scene, uh, you know, something where there's going to be a, a very, you know, extensive uh, amount of work required, um, quite often I'll just say to my assistant, let's talk to the sound guys and let's turn this chunk over to them. And, um, you know, we'll ask for a track and usually they're more than happy to oblige. And, you know, Larry touches on a really good point that I think uh, people who are unfamiliar with the process should know, too, is everybody has their own sound library, and that's great. Some, you know, of qualities that may vary. Uh, sometimes you have great sounds, sometimes you have horrible sounds. But the one thing that I have learned over time, and assistant editors should take heed, is if you already have a sound team set, you know, and you don't always. Sometimes, sometimes they hire the sound team very late in the game, which really needs to not happen, but it does all the time. Um, when you do temp sound, you are, you're using sound that may or may not be clearable or may or may not be good, but oftentimes you can reach out to your sound team, and if they have time, they tend to be very amenable to, hey, we have this chase scene, and it's this car, it's a, it's a, a, a muscle car, so I need a heavy rumble, and, a, and you're setting the stage for, you know, doing sound design with sounds that came from them, which means they know the sounds, they're high quality sounds, and if there are rights issues with them, they are probably clearable sounds, which means you're making a more predictable um, sound bed. Because when you turn over sounds and you go, where'd you get this from? I downloaded it from YouTube. You go, well, we definitely can't clear that. So all of that's going to need to be replaced. So that's right. one, that's a lot of work for the sound team. And then you run into the danger of if you have too many temp sounds and your director falls in love with that sound and they go, I love that sound that you had in temp. You know, now you've kind of put the sound team in the position of, yeah, but we don't know where it came from. So we don't know if we can clear it. And so like that's that's another one of those good habits to get into. Just like, uh, you know, sometimes I always feel like I'm being lazy. I'm like, I should look for the sound. But I was like, no, you should talk to your sound team because you will make everybody's lives easier for it, you know. Yeah. Well, and also it gives the assistant editor an opportunity to really know the nuances that go into editing. I mean, like I was thinking about just with sound design, I'd go outside and I'd just stop and I'd listen. What are all the sounds that go on? Because, and also in film, when you're listening and you're noticing, huh, it feels empty. Like when there's not a lot of sound design you notice the difference, and I think that what an opportunity for assistant editors to, as much as that can be scary to go into that if they don't really know sound very well or, you know, uh, effects uh, and temp scores and stuff, but but once they do, it's like, wow, that that just brings the, the uh, film alive in the TV show. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that you made the distinction of that. Um, well, and, sure. and especially in, in this age of music uh, or uh, music uh, of visual effects, too, the one thing I always feel like s where sound is sound sells everything visually. And as I've been doing more visual effects, uh, you know, work, it's so funny how, you know, you can put the muzzle flash on the gun, but it still looks like a person going like, you know, shaking their wrist right. until you drop the right sound effect that really sells it, that really makes it real. And so that's why I just have endless respect for the sound teams, you know, and, and the music teams that, uh, that have the, you know, that, that enhance that emotion, you know, um, 
through through score. You know, that's 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 it's 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 an amazing thing when they all those come together. Yes, yes, it is. Um, you do have a course called the Avid Practice Media. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Is that incorporating everything that would go in, like sound design and put cutting a film together? That's not. <clears throat> that's actually not a course. That is um, practice media. That is um, media for people who might not have dailies. Uh, well, Richard, why don't you explain how we put that together? Uh, that was from a short film, a short festival film that we, uh, worked with, uh, we licensed from our friends over at Edit Stock. Yeah. Misha Tannenbaum. Misha Tannenbaum's uh, company. And, uh, Richard kind of, uh, you know, put together the material so that it would work in an avid project because it was originally for Premiere, I think. Yeah, and you know, even more than that, the the thing I really wanted to simulate with that, ultimately, that media was what we used to teach the course because we needed footage that we could use, and you know, the studios weren't just going to give us their own footage, so we had to find some way to get media to teach these classes with. But then it morphed into, um, you know, I had a bunch of QuickTime media and a bunch of SoundMaster files. But that's not the way professional dailies labs give you this material. Uh, and so it was really important. I didn't want people to take QuickTime files and go, well, I import a QuickTime and then I import a WAV file and that's my dailies. And I go, if you're working in indie, sure. But if you're working a studio film, that will never happen. Just about never happen. You know, you will get the footage. It'll go through the lab. They'll sync it for you. And the sync may or may not be good. And it's really important to know how you deal with that when it is bad, because there are times when you simply need to kick it back. And there are times when you might be able to make it work and you can do a few things to deal with that. And so I took the footage and I ran it through Resolve, uh, which is one of two, one of multiple tools different labs will use to do their dailies. But the, the goal was to uh, create uh, an experience that as closely mimics what a professional dailies lab will hand to you because what a lab will generally hand to you on a film is they'll hand you OP Atom MXF files. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's exactly why we created this product because if you don't know how to bring that in, this is our opportunity to go, that probably looks weird to you. Let me show you how you bring it in, you know. Uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, the lab generally will give you an Avid bin. They'll generally give you OP Atom MXF files, and they'll usually give you an ALE, which you may or may not use. And so the idea is, this is what you're probably going to be getting. This is how you bring it into the Avid, and this is how you check the metadata to make sure everything that should have gotten in gets in, because nine times out of 10, it's totally fine, but you need to be aware either if, you know, you have a list of shots and you go, hey, you told us there was supposed to be 67 files and I actually have 65 I'm, I'm missing two you know and so you know how to track track potential errors and just how to deal with this thing that might be a little foreign if you've never seen it before you know all of that to say is you know it's always going to be a little scary when you're stepping into this world if you've just been working on stuff on your own but if you have just a basic familiarity with it you know at least it will it, it'll, it'll put you in a better position to go Okay, that's okay. So that's how I have to deal with this, you know. So yeah. then, and also well, the the paperwork, uh, the the related paperwork, uh, we tried to replicate, you know, to the best of our ability, the script uh, notes and um, editor logs, uh, editor logs, things like that. So uh, the avid practice media is that a part of the immersion course, or that's in addition? You need to purchase that so that you can work within the course and follow along. Is that how that works? Or? You know, a lot of our students are working assistants, you know, so they have access to media files and script notes and logs and things like that. We decided to put together that package for people who, who just don't have access to that kind of material. Um, and if you're a student, you get a hundred dollar discount off of it. So yeah, I like that. It's a discount. No, I yeah. think that's great. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're taking a course, you kind of want to be able to work in the, with the media that you're going to be working. Yeah. The, Hands on. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about software updates or newer versions of a program, you know, like mm -hmm. Avid. Um, and, and then when you're creating a course and then Avid 
goes to a new version, you know, that's probably a lot of work to have to recreate the course. So do you mind just talking about that? Because I know that probably studios are still using older versions, and I'm sure that the the changeover is pretty infrequent. So how do you handle that with updating courses or not updating? You know, well, Richard and I have t have talked a lot about this, and uh, you know, it's been a it's been a, a certainly a topic of of debate. The interesting thing that you just said, though, uh, Tammy, is that uh, the studios, um, you know, have these upgrades, and and it's not the studios, um, it's the editors. Yeah. And I, it, it, you, you know, ironically, and this has actually been a thing that I've spoken to people from Avid about. Um, a huge portion, I don't want to put a number on it because I don't really know the hard and fast numbers. And I think it's changing a little bit over the last maybe year or so, maybe less. Uh, most editors do uh, not want to change the version of software that they have been working on for years. And we're talking about people who want to work on the same software that uh, was uh, released in 2018. Um Old habits die hard. People get used to a certain, uh, you know, interface. I mean, how many times have you gotten a software upgrade where you're like, oh, man, now I have to learn this thing all over again. And you, you kind of don't have to learn the whole thing over again, but there's just enough to drive you crazy. You know what I mean? And uh, that is the nature of of the beast. I mean let's say you're you're rolling from one project to the next you don't have the time or you don't want to take the time to get up to speed on a new piece of software if it if it's been like an entire interface overhaul even if the fundamentals are are there um I, you know some people don't mind it but but we've found uh the majority of people uh, don't want to uh, don't want to take the time to uh, to make the switch. Uh, having said that, I'll let Rich chime in because he has a lot of uh, a lot of insight into this. Well, you know, it's funny too because even beyond the even beyond the old habits die hard, which is something I absolutely empathize with when you're talking about you know. And obviously, I'm coming from the standpoint of an assistant editor, but I imagine you know for the editor when you have you know, several executives in your room and, you know, the producer and the director and they're all there and they're just trying to get to the finish line. At a certain point, you know, the editor's chair, there's there's kind of a performative nature of it. You are executing quickly and you're trying to make things go. And, you know, there's obviously a, a, a perception you want to keep up. And that perception is that you are moving things along. And if you have a new version of the software, that changes something very fundamental that you used to do and do well, and now they and like something as something as seemingly small as they simply moved one keyboard shortcut somewhere else, you know. And it's like, okay, that seems small, but when you have that muscle memory and you're moving fast, and now you're hitting the key and nothing's happening, and there's seven high-level executives standing behind you, going, "Why is he hitting a button and nothing's happening?" That's that's some serious pressure. And so I have a lot of empathy for, you know, for editors who uh, who don't want to change what they're used to because there is a big, you know, there is something to that. And for me as an assistant editor and visual effects editor, the other thing that often happens is a new version of the software comes out and one of two things tends to happen frequently. Either a new feature, I'll read about it and I'll say, oh my gosh, that is so cool. That sounds like that could save save me so much time. And then one of the early adopters, and uh, thank goodness for early adopters, you know, they'll say, yeah, I I tried that feature. It doesn't really work the way you think it does. So then you go, okay, so, okay, it's not quite there yet. And maybe it'll get there. Uh, so that's kind of the first thing that comes up. Or the other thing that happens is you get a new feature and you say, oh, that's so cool. That's going to save me a lot, of, a lot of trouble. You go, yes, but remember that old thing you used to do? Yeah, it's broken in this version. Oh, well, I need that thing in order to get my turnovers done. So as much time as I'll save getting this new feature, if I can't do that old thing, I just can't use this new version. And, you know, and that's, that is critical. I find, you know, the things I always think about as an assistant editor are, is this going to impact my turnovers? Is, you know, when we get to the end of the line and I need to start passing this over 
to the to the sound and picture department and you know there's massive amounts of money based on me being able to get that out quickly and efficiently if that stuff starts going south you know and i can't answer why that's a problem and so that can prevent us from moving forward you know so and i mean my i actually only just upgraded to the most recent version of avid version 2023 uh, two weeks ago my last show was done on 2018 Every show I've done prior has been done on 2018. So that's all to say is, you know, we have had people say, when are you going to update to the new version? And part of it is, is like, well, I'm not using the new version on my home system. So we'll need to update it eventually because I would like students to see how we do it on the new versions because I've already been playing with the new versions and I found a few of those things where I go, oh yeah, that is a little, little different. So yeah, that could use a little update. But I have found by and large, you know, the differences in the new versions are they're fairly superficial and the fundamentals of what we teach, you know, and our aim has always been to be that we are not teaching you how to use Avid. We're teaching you how to use an assistant editor so or how to be an assistant editor. And so um, the fundamentals and the process is what we're teaching. And to a certain degree, there'll always be a little uh, a little adjustment because every vendor is going to have slightly different specs. I can't teach you every spec of every vendor in town because they're all a little different. But as long as you understand the process fundamentally, you can go, oh, okay, I got this spec and they're asking for this. Okay, well, yeah, you you, you have the tools you need to get there. That's uh-huh. fine, you know. Do you think it could just be like, you know, even just one video really update of, oh, uh, it's here instead of here now or something like that? Is that like, or, I mean, is there a point where you're going to have to do a whole overhaul of this do you there think? absolutely will be yeah at a certain point because yeah you know we could we, we've done that before with uh updates to the code book and the tricky thing with doing one-off updates is one thing changes and then another thing changes and then another thing changes and now you have like the flagship course and 20 little like one-offs and at a certain point you're just gonna have to go here's how we're doing it nowadays you know and so yeah. You know, it's interesting because, uh, he, 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 you know, like Richard said, eventually he, he, we will do it. But I don't think I've had one person say to me anything about being on the latest version. I mean, we've, we've, we've been asked, do you teach it on the latest version? But none of our students who have taken the course have had any problem working with 2018, which is the version we do it on, who have gone on to work on 2023. So, because like Richard says, it's the fundamentals are the fundamentals. Really, uh, in my opinion, and and of course, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what's under the hood, but from an editor standpoint, most of the uh, changes between these two systems, uh, between these two versions, uh, are cosmetic and and you know it's it's funny too kind of on the subject of older you know versions there's, there's there's kind of a lot of things we do in our process that sometimes seems more archaic and is still really important and i still think like the biggest example of that is the edl you know like the edl <laughs> is like in many ways extremely archaic technology. I mean, I can't even remember the last time I saw a VTR, you know, much less used an EDL to, to you know, reconstitute a show that way. But EDLs are still super critical because, you know, nowadays more, more common fare for turnovers is you'll turn over an AAF and that can be brought into whatever software people are using. Uh, but they're not human readable. And if anything goes wrong in that AAF, you really don't have a good way to check where the problems are. And EDLs are great because uh, certainly if you've never read an EDL before, they look like hieroglyphics. But you know, once you kind of understand what you're looking at, they're very human readable. Uh, most the VFX labs and most dailies labs have automated systems that parse EDLs. And it's really because it's a it's, it's a text file that can be broken apart and that a lot, and even to the point that I remember uh, some of the last shows I've been working as a VFX editor lately, so that, uh, this has been less of my workflow. But some of the last shows that I was assistant editing on, uh, we started doing what they called a preload, 
which was sort of like uh, it's sort of like an before you lock, you would send an EDL out to the lab, and that way they could at least use that to go. These are all the masters we're going to have to pull so that we at least have all of these files ready to go, so that when they actually start doing the online, they've saved the time of pulling all these files. And really, that's based upon EDLs being human readable technology even if even if ED, and edls have a world of limitations i mean particularly with how it deals with things like speed warps and dissolves and that's fine as long as everyone knows how to deal with those and most people who are taking these edls do you know yeah you get a speed effect don't trust that yeah just just don't trust it and if you and you know and most assistant editors know before you send the edl off take dissolves off you don't want to have transitions on there you know but there's a, a world of good that happens with those. So every now and then I'll see people kind of get smug and go, EDLs, what is this, 1997? And I was like, EDLs are still great. I, I kind of live and die by them. Having said that, and just calling back a little bit to the interface issue, um, I just want to interject here, which many of your listeners will probably have heard of by now, is you know we're entering into a time of great change. Avid was just sold to a private equity firm, so... We have no idea what's going to happen in terms of that deal. Uh, we don't really think that the Avid will go away, but who knows what kind of changes could come from that. And then, of course, we have the great AI paranoia and fear, a legitimate and probably not legitimate, but the industry is changing uh, probably as much as I've ever seen it change. So who knows what's on the horizon? I think, obviously, I think editors are going to be working on, you know, the current version of Media Composer and maybe older versions of the Media Composer for for the, the um, foreseeable future. But once that change sort, sort of starts to saturate the market, you know, then all bets are off. So we're going to have to, uh, we're, we're certainly keeping our eyes, ears, and uh, heads uh, about ourselves to see, you know, what evolves. And what we're going to have to, you know, provide, uh, you, you know, the next generation of, of assistants and editors. Yeah. So are there any projects you're working on now? In terms of uh, Master of the, work? the Workflow. Yes. Uh, we are working on a sort of a post-production fundamentals course. Uh, all the things that are required to get your foot in the door and get that first job that you that most people will get as uh, an, as an intern you know, not necessarily not paid in turn, but uh, that first job on the ladder, assistant, post-production runner. Uh, we're working actually with one of our students, uh, Mark Bessler, and uh, we hope to have that out uh, at some point in the near future if uh, we could just uh, get the work done. <laughs> it's just me and Rich. I mean, you know, it's like, it's not like we're a big company, so it takes time. And, you know, like little, the new products come out all the time. Like one of our most recent products is the EDL Importer, which was that came about based on my uh, the project I just wrapped, which was a big visual effects project for Disney. And it was a situation where, you know, I've been working on a lot of shows lately where there is an established show database and it kind of, you know, required me to face uh, face the music a little bit in the sense of uh you know, if I get overly dependent on my own database and then I work on a show where I can't use it, it's like, oh, okay, well, that is now I need to find a different way of dealing with this. And I've certainly gotten used to a lot of the automation that my database had. But on some of these bigger shows, you might have a database that is mandated by the studio, uh, the kind of database that, you know, is it you might have access to a very small subset of it because it also feeds things like budgets to the studio directly and you know uh scheduling for other departments you know and so you know you go they have their system the system that they've built by their own in in-house engineers and you cannot mess with that and so but i wanted to find a way to introduce automation that could feed that um you know, based on some of the things that we've built in our own code book. And that led to the EDL importer, which was this tool that allows us to do, among other things, uh, import an EDL and add visual effects names on it. Because uh, the one thing I found is, you know, uh, for, for uh, if you're familiar with the term VFX spotting, it's, it's a process that we usually do 
where, you know, we watch down the show in real time with the editor, with the director. And, you know, depending on what stage we are in the process, maybe some of the producers. And we just kind of go, that's a shot. That's a shot. That's not a shot. You know, so you're just kind of looking at, you know, things that you thought might have been shots, might not need to be. And when you're done with it, you have a bunch of markers on your your shots and then you give them shot numbers and then you start turning them over. Well, I was working on a shot recently where uh, we're working on a show recently where basically the opposite was the issue. Um, nearly every shot was a shot, and the exceptions to the rules were that is a non VFX shot. So, you know, out of your entire 600 to 700 shots in an episode, maybe 15 didn't have visual effects. And so the idea was you can import uh, an EDL out of there, and based on that EDL, you can drop a marker on every single shot. It will give a number to every single shot. It will increment it by 10, by 20, by 30. Because I found when I used to do that by hand, it becomes a very mechanical process. And there's nothing worse than when you've dropped the same number on two shots and you don't realize it until you're done. And then you go, every single number past this point is wrong and has to be fixed. And it always it never happens at the end. It always happens at the beginning. And then you have to fix every single shot in the cut. And then you have to give it what's called a sub cap, you know, so that a number shows up visibly in the timeline in addition to the markers in the cut. And so it was our opportunity to go, this is a process that is incredibly monotonous and takes a long time. Let's find a way to do this fast, you know, and save us a little time and give us time to think, you know, creatively about other things, you know, and so that's our newest offering. So like, like we find that as our process evolves, you know, any opportunity to share those with our students then just kind of becomes, hey, here's the, ne the next product, you know. I, I love it. Um, so the EDL, which is an edit decision list, the importer, is that done in FileMaker 2 or is that, and that's integrated to Avid so you can connect so it, it is a FileMaker based tool. And the idea is, you know, we, we kind of, you know, I sat down and figured out what data can come out of the Avid and what data can go into the Avid. So what can come out of the Avid is you can kick text out of the Avid in the form of a marker list or a subcap list. You can send an EDL out of the Avid. You can send ALEs out of the Avid and you can kick out tab delimited text files of your bins into the Avid. So that's all the added that av material that can come out of the Avid. Once I can get that out of the Avid, I can bring that into FileMaker. Then I can manipulate that data and then data that can go back into the Avid. I can send an ALE into the Avid if I want to add metadata to my clips. I can send a marker list back into the Avid. So, for example, you know, your markers typically have your name. My markers will usually have RJS, which is my initials. But maybe I want all of those to be named something different. I want them to be named VFX, so I always know what it is, and I want them to have a number. So I can do that in FileMaker. It just does everything automatically. I can bring markers back in. I can bring subcaps back in. And I recently was playing with a tool that allows us to kick an EDL back in. So, for example... If you get 80 visual effects at the end of the day, and typically your visual effects will be some version of the same naming convention, but the number that's always consistent is typically the first seven letters are the VFX names. So just for the sake of example, let's say it's in VFX 1000, and then it might be like, it might be called Anim if it's an animation, it might be Comp if it's a Comp, it might be called Layout if it's early and they're just trying to kind of figure out the environment, you know? But the very last number is typically the version number. So using a little trickery, we figure out a way that you can import an EDL of all your shots. Then you can import a text file of all of your incoming shots. So let's say I have 80 shots, but I'm just replacing 80 shots that are already in the cut. I could cut those in manually, but that'll take time. So you can take an EDL, you can take the names of the incoming shots, put those together, and it'll borrow the time code that's in the cut already, it'll switch the name so it takes the new names, and then you've just cut in 80 shots instantaneously. And as long as the time code doesn't change from your vendor, which sometimes it does, sometimes they just kind of move stuff around. So there's always the human element needs to be there and you need to check things. But they're just like little ways that we go, if we can save you this time, because I have found you always tend to get these dumps of 80 to 90 shots right around 8 o'clock at night. And you're just like, oh. On a Friday. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, if we can get, if we can get, get, uh, if 
we can get our students home a little earlier, you know. Yes, that's, that's great. I mean, you have so awesome that uh, you're working in the field, both in different ways, editor and assistant editor and visual effects, really trying to uh, simplify things by creating something that people can use to really uh, make their workflow go faster. Because isn't that all what it's all about is speed, especially with those yeah. tight de deadlines, you know, and I get that. But but the trick is as as important as speed is, nothing is more important than accuracy. So it's always like, how can we, you know, I always find with automation, it's like, it is a matter of, it is faster, but also for me, because my typing accuracy, I'm a little embarrassed to admit is horrific. So, you know, which is why I, I used to always make mistakes typing those VFX names in, you know, and of course I double, double check everything and fix everything, but there's nothing more demoralizing than, yeah, again, you, you made a mistake three shots in and messed up every number after that. So it's like, now this way we can both be fast and accurate. And it's like, for me, it's like the accuracy. It's like the, just don't think about, you know, I didn't mess up a number. It's just there, you know? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you have a lot of uh, great programs and also courses. Is there any last thoughts you want to leave our listeners with? The only thing we haven't talked about is ScriptBinder, which is yeah. another brilliant piece of FileMaker that uh, Richard cooked up. Oh, yeah. ScriptBinder, that, uh, that, it's funny. That, that came about, uh, I was working a show. It was going to be my first show that was remote from the beginning. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, I was like, there are plenty of ways of doing Avid remotely, but building binders is something that the assistant has to do for the editor. And I was like, how do I do that digitally? Or or how do I do that in a way that's going to work in a remote workflow? And, you know, I was trying to find different ways of combining PDFs. And I found ultimately like everything I was doing was super labor intensive and the end result wasn't even that elegant. So I'm like, if I'm going to work really hard and end up with something that's not that user friendly, what's the point? And so leaning on you know, what I what I was familiar with was FileMaker. It's like, let's just do this. And, you know, just kind of, we created a digital script binder so we can have your uh, line, your, your facing pages and your line script and just go through, you know, and if you have multiple facing pages, you can just scroll bar and, you know, you just update it as you go every morning, you know. Wow. And searchable. That, that's great. Is that anything with the script supervisor? Is that anything that would be? Yes. So the script, the script and and what's what's useful about it is some script supervisors use a product called Script E, uh, which is a digital uh, script, a uh, digital line script, and some script supervisors work uh, handwritten scripts. And so you know, as long as it's anything that's been scanned, I have found that it doesn't respond very well to JPEGs. Something about JPEGs are can be a little heavy for it. But, uh, you know, you, you, it can be uh, scanned PDFs or it can be PDFs straight out of Scripty. And effectively, all it is is a it's a database that just displays a line script and associates the facing pages with it. So if you have one page with like seven facing pages, you can go through those and, you know, and yeah, it's easily searchable. So you can just click a button and go to page 32 or you can click on a scene number and it jumps to the scenes, just kind of like how you have with the line script. You know, if you have, you usually have scene tabs on there and just trying to recreate that experience, you know, for the editors, but in a digital world where things need to be shared because they, yeah, that way we can, you know, I was working on a one show and actually one of my favorite things about remote workflow is, you know, it opens the talent pool in that on that show, uh, the assistant editor of one team was in Los Angeles and the editor was in New York. And it's like, well, you can't be sending scripts. So yeah, just take this digital one and just send it to them in the morning and everybody's working. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool, cool project. It, it's a really cool product. And all of these products um, are, are being used on the biggest shows in, in Hollywood and in the UK and in Australia. Uh, you know, uh, it's always a thrill to get an order from somebody who's working on a big series or something like that because you're like, whoa, that's really validating. So, uh, you know, it's fun. Now, can multiple people working in the same time if you're passing it to other people to if they're doing something? Do Is there any input in it that somebody's doing or it's more just a navigation for the script so that you can get to things faster? 
So as far as simultaneous users go, uh, it benefits from all the infrastructure that FileMaker has. So for example, if you're using FileMaker server, you can upload it directly to FileMaker server, meaning two people can be looking at the same file at the same time. Because there is a section, we added a little notepad in case editors, you know, sometimes editors want to jot down notes in the margins. So, you know, we just put, basically have a little notepad so they can write their notes. So that's one way that you can work simultaneously. Or if you don't have that kind of infrastructure, if you don't have FileMaker server, you can just send it, you know, the assistant editor can just keep it and add new pages and send it to the editor every morning. And for example, if the editor adds notes that they don't want lost, well, then the editor can just send their copy back to the assistant editor. They can update that and send it back to the editor. So whether you're working on a small team that has less resources, you can work that way and you can still preserve all of that information. And we built it in a way the uh, the PDFs are stored externally. So, for example, uh, if there is concern for security and you just want to send the file, the FileMaker file, which has no uh, no pages embedded in it, because you don't want to put that on email and you know security concerns, that you can preserve all of that, and it also allows us to implement bug fixes. You know, every now and then we find someone like, hey, I did this and it caused a big problem. And I go, ooh, yes, that, that's a problem. Let me fix it. And that allows me to then take a product from them and I'll never see their script because it's all, it's stored externally. I can fix the product and then send it back to them and it'll line up to all their pages. And there you go. There's your fixed version. No rules have been broken. I haven't seen a script that I shouldn't see and everybody's good. Is the file size big? Like, can you send it via email or do you have to drop it on Google Drive or something because it could get bigger and bigger? Oh, well, everything's stored externally, so then it doesn't. It's, you know, it's stored on your computer. So if you want to send the pages, uh, generally the, the PDFs that come out of Scripty tend to be very small in file size. So those tend to be very manageable. It's when you have pages that are either scanned and especially JPEGs where it, it can it can really be the Wild West because you know every now and then people will take a picture on their cell phone, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that, but those file sizes can get pretty large pretty quickly. And so those are where I have found problems is um, the file sizes can get pretty big which means obviously sending them via email can be problematic and accessing them in the database when it has to keep track of these huge files, it can bog it down. Right. So yeah, it, in all that to say, yeah, it really depends on the files. Um, if the files are huge, ideally, then the database will get huge. Yeah, ideally you want to work with PDFs though. Yeah. Anything you want to say to the listeners as we close? Uh, biggest thing I've always stressed upon everyone is... Uh, you know, be kind and be curious and happy editing. Yeah. And if you're interested in becoming an editor, the first place to start is becoming a really good assistant editor because that's how you move up in this industry. We didn't make the rules. That's the way it's been for probably a good last 50 or 60 years. And uh, you talk to any of the really big editors working on the biggest films today, I'd say 95% of them started as a, as assistants. That's just that's the nature of our craft. It's a, it's an apprenticeship program, and and you know you work your way up from uh, from the beginning. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Richard, and thank you, Lawrence, for your time. This was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us, Tammy. Uh, best of luck, and uh, we look forward to uh, checking it out. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it and follow me on Instagram at Tammy McGarrow. Until we meet again, what's your story?